Hey guys, what's up? I'm CJ and welcome back to my galaxy. Today we are continuing the IRS Media series and this is episode two. Today I'm going to be talking to Rachel from Angsty Ace and we are going to be talking about all things The Hunger Games and all things to do with queer coding in the hunger games if you haven't already go give rachel a follow i have all her details in the description and in the comments section but without further ado let's get into the video all right hi my name is rachel otherwise known as angsty ace on primarily tiktok but also instagram i am an arrow ace educator activist creator whatever you want to call it and i am so excited to be here with you today cga we're discussing queerness and being our ace in the Hunger Games specifically and how that came yeah. to different characters. I mean, you know what? I'm a little bit curious. This is already, we just started and I'm going off yeah. script, but um, your relationship with the Hunger Games as a piece of media, as an ace person, you know, not even necessarily talking about yeah. the ace aspects of it yet, but just, just your experience with it. I mean, I have grown up with the Hunger Games, and I've been reading it since I was nine. I don't know about you. Um, when did like you ten for me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So quite, quite quite young. Probably shouldn't have been We're reading it quite young. young. Yeah. Material. Yeah. yeah. It was quite graphic for nine and ten year olds, but yeah, anyway. I remember when I got into the Hunger Games, the Catching Fire movie had just come out. Yeah, um, I got into it because I watched the first movie when it came out in 2012. I watched the first Hunger Games movie and then I was like obsessed with it immediately and started reading the book straight after. Yeah, yes. and yeah, I guess it influenced a lot of my personality. So I guess it, it would have to be queer somewhere in there, you know, if I'm influenced so much by right. it. Yeah. For me, I actually read the book before seeing the first movie. I read the yeah. first book, and then I saw the first movie, and then I ended up watching the Catching Fire movie before I read it, just because it had just come out, and it was just more convenient than having to sit down and wait to read the book. In terms of that relationship to the book, I think something that's yeah. really, really telling for me as an ASEC person is, like I said, I loved the Hunger Games. Still do. Diehard Hunger Games fan. Yeah, same. Because I was invested in the love triangle. I did not care. I have always been interested in the Hunger Games, honestly, for the... I mean, I love other characters, of course, like yeah. Faith, Joanna. But for me, the highlight has always been the adult characters. When I first read it, and all throughout middle school, I was a really, really big Haymitch fan. Still am, oh, but God. now I've definitely shifted a little bit more towards Effie. I still love them both, but now, especially with Elizabeth Banks in the movies, I'm really, yeah. really interested in Effie as a character. Um, I actually... I did her for Halloween this past year with my roommate with Haymitch. She was super that. fun. Yeah, it was so good. I wore false lashes for the first time. <laughs> they were inch long tinsel. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. I caked my face with colors, and it was magnificent. Yes. Um. I'm sure, it was. Yeah. But yeah, when I was younger, I wasn't as invested in the romance and you know the characters that were my age. You know, Katniss, who we're seeing the stories lens through. I was more interested in. Some some of the older characters, um, some of the conflicts that didn't have to do with with romance, and of course, as an aspect person, you can by all means love romance, and I oh, like yeah, it in a lot of romance. Romance. But that's not the thing that that grabbed me in. Yeah, it, I feel like a lot of the Hunger Games, because of when it was made, the movie specifically, uh, it was made around like that Twilight love triangle era. I see a lot of discourse mm -hmm. around that. That uh, I, it is my sincere belief it was made, if it was made now, it would have romance, but it wouldn't be the main marketing point of it. Uh, the only yeah. reason that we see the prequel with the main marketing point is because it's supposed to trick you in a way and tell the story through a, ro a romance. When it comes to the romance, it's, it's not a focal point at all. It's just. And it's not even real yeah. romance for most of it. No, yeah. it's not. And I think sometimes the films can lose a little bit of that. Yeah. But um, overall, I think they're absolutely fantastic. I, I really do. I think really, really great adaptation from, from novel to movie. One of the better book to movie adaptations, I thought. 100%. Yeah. It's quite accurate, uh, except the original four movies, I would say, don't have as much depth, which they're, mm -hmm. they kind of 
left the depth out in order to put all of the the main plot points in, which was that's true. Sort of surprise, but it's still pretty I good. will say, I, I think part of the reason I have so much respect for it as a film franchise is because my other favorite series around that time was the Giver series. A lot of people don't know this, but okay. the, the Giver actually has a, it's a full four book series, mm. and I was obsessed with it. And then I remember. I don't even know how old I was. It was sometime in middle school. Uh, they came out with the film version of The Giver. I cannot even begin to tell you how much of a monstrosity that movie was. It was just oh, so, yeah. like, it took out everything. Like, they aged up the characters. They, random rules, too. Like, the very first page of the book talks about how no planes are allowed in the whole city. And then for some reason, they not only scrapped that, but they decided the main character's best friend was going to become a pilot. And it's like, why? <laughs> it's yeah. just so bad. So I think it's especially weird. because they, they butchered my other favorite series, the Hunger Games films meant even more to me because yeah. they were done. So. Yeah, I haven't read the Give a book, but I have watched the movie and it was like the most insane fever dream movie I've ever watched. <sighs> it was it you was ever like, have a chance to the book. The book is magnificent. Oh, yeah. And there's four in the series. It's not like... It's not all with the same characters, but the characters are all connected. Connected, and by the fourth one, you will see how all of the characters are connected. Oh, okay. Cool. It's that yes. type vibe. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, you, and yeah. Like, the first one can be a standalone. So if you only, yeah. you only ever read the first one, all I ask yeah. is anybody who's only seen the movie, please watch. Please read the book. It's so good. The movie does not do it justice at all. Yeah, it, it was during the it, the the two movies. They were just during the eras of just tropes particular tropes that ruined the original meaning of the novels and I think it's really um important to discuss because when it comes to like looking at queerness with the Hunger Games is that a lot of the depth that we see in the books and a lot of the queer codes are lost when it comes to the movies speaking of um if the Hunger Games was released in a different time Hmm. I do think that there would be openly queer characters Oh yeah. If it was definitely. released a bit later. Like one hundred percent. So many of the characters are queer coded. And I don't think it would be token openly. I don't think they'd try to yeah. be pushing anything. It wouldn't be like, oh, poorly written token queer character. It would just be more open. Like everybody would understand that it's a queer character. Oh yeah. But instead, because of the time frame, they just kind of had to make a couple characters eccentric and call mm-hmm. it a day. I know with um, the prequel that came out last year, I know a lot of people took Coral, who was the District 4 uh, person with the Trident. Um, she was kind of queer coded as like the, I don't know if they said non-binary, but non-binary bisexual type because of the way she looked. And it went around the internet that everyone was like, this is the queer coded character here. It wasn't said specifically, but I think it was. Yeah that way. Oh, and that's another thing that, I mean, I have on my list that we can talk about later. Yeah. Uh, um, the idea, because we see in the prequel how much the capital has changed in those, what, yes. 70 years or however much time, it, I don't know the exact time frame, Um, especially with things like progressiveness, and so that also makes me think, how did queerness differ in the capital from, yeah. you know, Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes to um, you know, the original trilogy time frame. And I think another one that is queer coded specifically that I've seen in the fandom pretty much ever since I joined it was that Katniss is possibly uh a romantic asexual, like a demi romantic. Definitely that's a big one. Yeah. I think Joanna's a big one as well. I see a lot about I Joanna. Heard that one. Jo- really? No, a haven't. lot of people think Joanna gives bi energy. To be fair, I think that might just be because she's more rebellious and people think, oh yeah, she, yeah. she'd do it. Um, but, and, and we talked about this briefly, um, the only character whose queerness has ever been spoken on by any of the team, uh, is, um, Effie, who yes. Elizabeth Banks, yes. this is very brief in an interview, Elizabeth Banks was asked in an interview just out of all of her work if she's ever played an LGBTQ plus character and yeah. she said, you know, not a confirmed character, but she personally believes that Effie is pansexual. And I have to be honest, anything Elizabeth Banks says, 
I take as the truth. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I'm such a big fan of the series. Like, people, and people who don't realize that, they don't know. Like, the second they, she found out they were making a movie, she talked to her entire team and said, somebody needs to get me an audition for this role. <laughs> like, yeah. she seriously has been a fan from day one. So in my brain, anything that woman says goes. I think that's the only time that anybody has even spoken on queerness in, yeah. in the franchise we know that the capital is from suzanne collins as well and just the aesthetic of the movies that it is very based on rome and a lot of the names are roman centric yes. or latin centric and that the way There's that one that's good are you seeing yeah. greek oh okay Euphemia yeah. is the full full name for Effie, and Euphemia is Greek. At pretty much everything else is is Latin. Yeah, Effie just likes being different. So he just yeah, kind of a sign of her being queer. Yeah. Different. Suzanne Collins' story of coming up with the Hunger Games is that she was flicking between war coverage of, I believe, Iraq, or at least war coverage in the Middle East, and mm-hmm. reality TV. Because at the time when she was writing it, there was a writer's strike. The first like. 2008, 2007 writer's strike and right. there was a lot of reality TV on that she was watching so a lot yeah. of what happened in the capital is based on Hollywood and reality TV and I wouldn't be surprised just since the topic is um, in the media right now, the Met Gala, I wouldn't be mm-hmm. surprised if she based some of the aesthetics off of that too. Oh definitely Yeah. and, and like you said um using warfare as an opportunity to glorify things yeah. it's not even close to a new concept and i feel like i'm learning about different things every day um yeah one that i learned about recently was the uh miss atomic uh miss atomic bomb pageant i don't know if you ever heard about that no, I haven't. Uh, when they were doing the atomic bomb testing in the 40s yeah um people wanted to come see it they didn't know how dangerous it was it was like a tourist attraction and so they decided to hold this contest kind of like a beauty pageant in las vegas to crown miss atomic bomb that is so odd that you would it's weird i only know this um because as people who follow me may or may not know i get attached to random middle-aged actresses (laughs) And the current person's Catherine Tate, and she was in a musical about this a couple of years ago. Miss Atomic Bomb was a, was a real contest. There's a very, very yeah. good example of the absolute crazy things people will do to make entertainment out of tragedies and terrible yeah. situations. You see that a lot in Hollywood as well, like ex- exploitation mm-hmm. of uh, true crime comes to mind as well, and then you yep. get a lot of war movies and just making entertainment out of just anything completely tragic and Hunger Games really highlights that and Suzanne Collins just yeah in on that well and as long as we're on the topic of exploitation we have sexual exploitation which is also big thing in Hollywood big thing in the Hunger Games universe yes and they really show that through Snow's Snow in the prequel is absolutely insane with his his inner monologue and how we can really see how it went from prequels all the way to Finnick and exploiting mm-hmm. victors because he at some point um, with Tigress he, mm-hmm. he, I don't remember the exact quote but he, he essentially says she's easy to abuse has a face and appearance of someone easy to abuse, it's insane definitely and that, that's a big thing which is something that is clearly taken from from Hollywood um, over the years, that's not just there. I think there's this weird conception that that's a, a modern thing. It's not a modern thing. No. It's been a thing. Um, another thing too that I'm curious about. Um, I always try to think about how open we think the capital would be. I don't know if this is modern, if this is changing over the years, but if you look at a history of Hollywood, um, there's actually a really great Netflix series. I don't know if you're familiar with it called Hollywood. It's a um mini series. It's one season. Absolutely fantastic. A lot of that does highlight uh, the queerness in Hollywood in the 40s. And a lot of stuff was underground. It was everywhere. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't out in the open. And so I definitely wonder if the Capitol went through a period of that. I'm sure they did. If they're still partially in that. 
when we, you know, see them around the 74th Hunger Games, or if they've moved past that and now it's open more like how it is in Hollywood today or is leading towards. Something that is discussed in the fandom a lot is the fact that there is likely no sex education or birth control in the district yeah. at the very least. And if we're going along with that sort of idea that, you know, you have to constantly be procreating, having kids and you don't have any sort of sex education to prevent from having a bunch of kids. Um, it's likely that the districts are very have like a prejudice against queerness. And in when it comes to the yes. capital, I would say when we see things like royalty or the upper class, they constantly want the family name to be continuing, so they force people into heterosexual relationships in order to have more kids. And I would true. say the upper class, like Snow, would probably be forced into heterosexual relationships. But as for the more lower class, uh, the ones without the names that are known in the capital, the well-known names, uh, I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but I would say it might be a little bit more open to interpretation there. If we're also talking about aspects of ancient Rome, Another really, really interesting history fact I learned from my history major friend. Um, in ancient Rome, they didn't care who you were with. The gender, yeah, whatever. Yeah. What you were judged and shamed for. It wasn't if, if it was gay. It was all about power. It was about dominance. You were shamed if you weren't, you know, alpha. Um, yeah. Which is a really interesting, interesting concept for it to be. It has nothing to do with gender. It has to do with, with power. And that definitely makes me think, I, I could totally believe that there is an aspect of that in the capital because so yeah. much about the capital is power. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, it was knowing that a lot of people who are like in the upper class of the capital, saying upper class, like the capital as a whole is upper class, but the mm. more... Yeah, the upper, the is, upper, upper class. Yeah, the upper, upper class um, is if they, if they've known like side pieces to heterosexual marriages, uh, yeah, that that, ha that happens in history. That always has that people are openly gay in behind the scenes, away from the public. And I could also see a situation where if a person is powerful and wealthy enough, they can be openly gay and nobody really cares because yeah, they're powerful enough to do that. Once your status gets so high, you start to kind of have a shield around you for certain yeah. things. But talking about change, we see in the ballad of Songbirds yeah. and Snakes, there's a really, really big difference there. Um, compared to yeah. the capital that we're used to in the original trilogy. In the prequel it's I mean it was written in a different time as well. I think we have to keep that in mind that there is that difference. That mm -hmm. it was it's when the prequel was written, I, I the original trilogy started in two thousand eight and whilst it was known that queerness happens and it was more public back then. It's a lot more accepted now, like 15 years later. Mm. I have to be honest with with the with the people. I've yet to read the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I've oh I've had I've read excerpts of it. Yeah, I've read portions. I haven't read the whole thing. Um, so I might be a little bit inaccurate on this because I'm I'm judging based on the movie, based on kind of the society we see, but they definitely seem to be a bit more classic yeah. conservative. Like you said, the yeah. family names. Um, and so because of that, I definitely think that that openness that we potentially see in the trilogy is not there. I think it yeah. is very, very conservative. And I think, if anything, at that time frame, the districts might be more progressive. Because they were yeah. the radicals. Not, not that I'm saying they, they're fully progressive. I don't think they are, yeah. but more so. There is a gay ahead, couple ahead. in Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. The, really? the Covey has a lesbian couple. I think they were lesbians. I think they were women. That oh, I'm wow. Yeah. That's cute. They would. They yes. would. Yes, so it is. Yeah, it just it like came to me all of a sudden. Because when I was reading it, I remember going, oh, wait, they're both women. Oh, wow. I yeah. know. I still got to read it. I still got to do it. It'll happen. Yeah. I have the book. I'm in possession of it. I just need to read it. Have you watched the movie? I don't want to spoil it. I have seen the movie. Okay. I have seen the movie. Yes. So I spoil everything for myself all the time. Almost done with season one of the show that I'm watching right now, but I know everything that happens oh, because yeah. oops. queer character um, in the copy. So it's very likely that 
they were very accepting at the beginning. It and Snow also didn't react to them um, being in. They completely cut it out of the movie, but in the books, when Snow is in District Twelve, uh, he visits the Covey and he's kind of jealous of the fact that he goes off for a picnic with the Covey, but he's jealous of the fact that one of the Covey is staying behind to have alone time with her girlfriend. And Snow doesn't react to the girlfriend part. He reacts mm. to the fact that he's jealous that him and Lucy Gray can't have alone time. Which, by the way, mm. gets rid of the whole pregnancy Katniss related to Snow because Lucy Gray is her grandmother sort of theory. That was very roundabout way of saying it. But people think that yeah. Lucy Gray was pregnant with Snow's kid at the end of the movie. No, they were not alone at any point during their time together. I definitely think, you know, the idea of Katniss being a descendant, 100%, yeah. but of Lucy Gray specifically. I'm more on board the Mort Ivory train than anything. I think that one makes the most sense. So I would say the capital is aware of queerness in some way. And at the end of the prequel as well, we're told that Snow chooses Livia Kaju as his first lady because it's like you said before the idea of Rome and power he chooses her because he doesn't he feels like he will never love Livia Kaju and thus will not make him feel weak and will give him more power mm. in not falling in love with someone it's interesting that it's like a heterosexual relationship that they have that sort of power in that way 100% it's always been about power for mm. Snow in every aspect and I think that even I mean you see that even contributes to his relationships and Definitely. everything yeah really I think his stance on queerness would have absolutely nothing to do with what he thinks about queerness and everything to do about his power Definitely. I don't think he actually cares about queerness I, I would honestly say that he probably thinks that as long as it's kept behind closed doors and you're you know mm. giving birth to babies on the side for the name to continue, I, I doubt he cares. I don't think he cares. It, it's all about, yeah, it's all about his power and, and what's going to work for him. Like I said before, with Katniss and the head canon that she's demi-romantic, demisexual, I, I would say she's probably not, like, the whole I romantic all the way to the one side of the spectrum, simply because she is very clearly in love, has romantic feelings. For Peter, because she's so confused with her feelings towards Gail and Peter, I would say she's very confused about her sexuality in general. I mean, she's a teenager as well. Teenager yeah. In themselves. I also will say, I don't think she really thought about it much until she was thrusted into the world of mm. the capital and being a victor and having to play pretend, because I mean, she mentions a little bit about Gail in the beginning, but it's more like what he's thinking of her, like the little yes. things he says. It's not that she's actually thinking about anything with him or really trying to figure out how she feels about him. She knows at that point how she feels about him. Yes. Okay. It's not until she's thrown into that world of fake romance and everybody's flirting and all of these things that she yeah. starts to question herself because she starts to realize that it's something that exists. Yeah. And I think something else to add to that point is that in Catching Fire, she makes it very obvious that she wants to be friends with Peter first, that they, she wants to develop mm -hmm. that kind of relationship, and then she starts having feelings for him. And it's in the cave that I believe that she doesn't have romantic feelings for him because she feels like she has this different kind of emotional attachment to him at this point, that she wants to, she wants some kind of relationship, but it doesn't seem like it's romantic until they establish some sort of friendship. Yeah, and that is really shown by her thoughts because her thoughts, it is pure acting, which she is oh, not yeah. necessarily super well versed in too, and that shows. Um, you know, what's really interesting, I know we have this as a bullet point later, but what's interesting about that cave scene isn't just that she's playing pretending she's not interested, yeah. it's the fact that she doesn't really understand how. So oh, yeah. somebody, yeah, yeah. somebody who's experienced that, even let's say they have no feelings for Peter at all, you would still be able to mimic that. 
Yeah. She doesn't definitely. know how to mimic like every single thing she does. She's it's a complete guessing game. She has no idea what she's yeah. supposed to be doing because she's never felt that way about anyone. It's not just yeah. specifically about Peter. Yeah, there's no feelings there to guide her, I feel like, if you have those yes. kinds of romantic feelings. It, yeah. from, I mean, I haven't experienced that, but from what I've seen from other people. I haven't either, but yeah, yeah exactly. Well, yeah. And, and that's, that's definitely what I've heard, especially about things like kissing, right? People say, well, you just kind of know what to do. You just do what feels right. Yes. It's like, well, what does that mean? And definitely, yeah. like I said, I think somebody who wasn't interested in PETA, but had had other interests before, would just be able to mimic that. They might not be feeling yeah. that, but they know, you know, if this is what I was feeling, this is what I would do. Whereas yeah. Katniss just doesn't have any concept of that at all. Yeah, and her inner monologue as well, she's mimicking her parents because she knows that's what it's supposed to look like. And she, mm-hmm. she says, like, you know, I know my parents love each other, so let's do what my dad did. You know, he'd come home and with and like whatever flowers or whatever I don't remember exactly what he'd do but like have like yeah, some honey I'm home sort of moment and that's what she does when she's making soup I believe for Peter and he and she enters the cave kind of going like oh you're Peter like sort of thing in the books they don't have that they shorten the cave scene in the movies which is very they do though. and they don't have to drug him no that's so sad <laughs> I'm glad. See, this is why I, I love it when I'm talking to somebody who knows their books really well. Because I have yeah. have somebody who either hasn't read it or just maybe doesn't remember. They're like, what? I mean, it yeah, wasn't a real drug. It does basically drug him with like cough syrup. Yeah, it's it's like a it's like a sleep syrup thing that is very is common. It's a Okay, it's yeah, like I don't that. remember exactly. It's all a that matters. Syrup. He's yeah. drugged with syrup. Yeah, it was some sort of sweet syrup because i remember they like went in depth with the taste of it and peter knows yeah, that yeah, yeah taste. In, depth, in depth with the taste and what it actually did yeah, we we love that peter was drugged unfortunately he was only asleep oh, in the movie. Right. Peter was drugged yeah <laughs> wish wish it could have been in the movie just just for the haymitch aspect of it that's so funny. oh Isn't yeah the haymitch be? well because since we got to see haymitch's perspective on certain yes. things in the movie so imagine seeing Hamish's perspective of the decision to send her stuff to drug Peter. It would have been, he would have been laughing to himself. It was an opportunity that was missed yeah. there. It would have been so fun to watch, and yet they cut it out. What a shame! What a shame. And then, like, imagine, like, I would just love a moment of just, you know, Effie being pissed at him for that because <laughs> she would be. Honestly, oh, yeah, I wish that we could get an entire movie of just those two watching the games. I would I would live for that because their dynamic definitely developed during the games as well, and they became parents oh, yeah. to Peter and Katniss. They would have yeah. been like good bad so guys. Say what you want about moving to a different direction from the books. I loved the inclusion of Effie and Mockingjay. Some of her most iconic lines from Mockingjay Part One. Yes. Yeah, I think that what was. Are you it was the best. It was <laughs> I love the. This. Best change that they did, yeah. Have you even met Rouge? I love her. She's love great. That, yeah. Elizabeth Banks is great. Yes, definitely. Great. Thank you for your service, Elizabeth Banks, for slaying in those heels and dresses. Yeah, no one else could have done it. No one else could have done it. There's one moment that is in Mockingjay, I believe. Yeah, is in Mockingjay when they're in District 2 and Gail is saying, when he fell in love with, or uh, fell in love, I don't know if it would be love. The thing that happened was he was telling her about when they were in District 12 and a peacekeeper that they were quite close with, I think this was Darius that they were talking with, um, that mm-hmm. peacekeeper, the young one that t- yeah. got turned into an AVOX. Uh, he mm-hmm. was flirting with Katniss and suddenly Gail was jealous and Katniss was like, you weren't flirting with me. She's completely oblivious. To the yeah, fact she's that really, really oblivious to stuff like that. Yeah. I also believe it was Gail. I don't remember when this is, but he's almost kind of like he refers to her as kind of cold a lot of times when really yes. she just doesn't pick up on cues like that or she's Definitely. not returning his mm-hmm. affection. He goes, Oh, well, she's cold. She's you know, kind of almost refers to her as being um emotionally unavailable, which which yes. to an extent is kind of true, but a lot of that isn't her trying to do that. It's just her not not picking up on that and not yeah. experiencing those yeah, it's 
I think it's in the same scene that we're referring to that he tells it's it he says that it's like kissing someone who's drunk. This it's in the movie, but it's a little bit more in depth with the various uh plot mm. or backstory in the books. Yeah. It's that she doesn't I mean she's the face of a rebellion, first of all. And she's she doesn't pick up on those feelings for people unless someone goes Hey, did you not notice that you were acting towards, acting this mm-hmm. way towards them? You know, it's like in real life when someone goes, you know, you love flirting with them. You, you realize that, right? Yeah. Another thing too is how people have to tell her what to do specifically. They can't just say, oh, act romantic with Peta. They have yeah. to be like, do this. Especially Hamish is like, oh my God, please just do this. You know, I think a lot of, I mean, Hamish is always a little bit, you know, appears to be frustrated because he's yes. Hamish. But I think sometimes he's genuinely frustrated in a way where it's like, how does this girl not know how to do this? Yeah. Especially because Hamish himself went into the game at the same age and had presumably a long-term girlfriend. Yes. He's like, how is this girl, especially what he's seen between Katniss and Gale and people make assumptions, he's like, how is this girl so incompetent? And the iconic line, uh, you call that a kiss mm-hmm. in movies and books, is that he's essentially telling her during the games, the first games, that you know, that's, that's not how you be romantic, you know, slow burn to the extreme, man, Katniss. Yeah, yeah. Learn a little flirting skills. I feel like there are so many different areas that Katniss is so obviously oblivious to how she feels. She, she almost sees romance as weakness. For example, yes. when she gets mad and she said, um, he made me look weak, and then Hamish counters back, he made you look desirable. Yes. She, she definitely... I think because she doesn't understand the emotional aspect of that necessarily, she just sees the idea of romance as, oh, somebody has to take care of you or something like that. Yeah, definitely. It feels like a weakness. Like It feels like, oh, she can't do anything herself, so she has to have another person do it for her. I think that ties into the area of her just not understanding how to act around romance because she doesn't have experience with it. Well, only with her parents, really, that's her experience. And even then, she doesn't pick up why someone would want to be in a relationship like that because it, she sees it as a weakness. You know, she's vulnerable. Um, and not to like make a parallel with Snow, but Snow also is, thinks like that. And I think that that dynamic really adds. Yeah. To Definitely. Another thing, I could be remembering this wrong, but I do think she has thought sometimes of how she doesn't understand why anybody would have kids because of what's happening. Yes. And that's a lot of, like you said, there's not good education, contraception. And so I think in her brain, sex is a choice to have kids. Yes. And so she's like, well, why do people do this? It's terrible to have kids in this environment. She doesn't understand doesn't understand sex outside of reproduction. I feel like that, from personal experience, when I was growing up when, as a teenager, that's how I saw sex a lot as well. 100% same. Yeah. I didn't understand. I didn't understand how un- unwanted pregnancies happened. That sex. was like, well, then why were you having sex? <laughs> yeah, it's like, were you not planning for that to happen? You know? Oh, exactly. exactly. Yeah, and in I, I know that like, also from past experience what i used to think was you know it's really easy to just abstain from sex and uh yeah it looks like katniss is exactly like that because she just seems to think it's really easy to just not be into romance and sex because she doesn't have those kinds of feelings so how does this the queer representation in katniss is katniss being demi-romantic and demisexual how do how do we think that develops from Really, I think it's there from the get-go, from that first conversation mm. with Gail. I think it's there from the very beginning. Definitely. It's... Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add. I know we talked about that conversation a little bit already. Yeah. Uh, about how he was kind of being suggest- suggestive. Yeah. Um, she didn't really. But she really sees them as siblings. There's one line that I pointed out because I'm going through on my channel at the moment and annotating some of the chapters. Is that one thing that I found absolutely hilarious is that Katniss actually points out that they're very likely cousins. That it, it's like an <laughs> yeah. actual line. I can literally, I will literally read oh, it to you. Thing. I, I was kind of remembering that and I was like, maybe, I, maybe I'm just making that up. No, I'm glad you hear that's an actual thing. 
it's in the first conversation that they have in the first chapter and I pointed it out in somewhere he could be my brother straight black hair olive skin we even have the same gray eyes but we're not related at least not closely so she's aware that maybe distant distantly they're probably related yeah, and also, I'm sorry, somebody that has any thoughts of romance or thinks that person is interested in her would never talk about how they look like siblings. Yeah, if, if you look related, like, you can't really point out. What the heck does it mean that's how she thinks of him? Yeah, definitely. You know, if his family, he's not, he's no romantic partner when they're in the capital before the games. And yes. Peter confesses his love to Katniss. I think we touched on it before as well, that mm-hmm. he, Peter made her feel weak because she doesn't see romance in that way. And I think her anger is also a mask for how uncomfortable she is. I think she's just uncomfortable by the whole concept. And that freaks her yeah. out and she's uncomfortable and embarrassed and therefore her go-to is anger. She's not, she's just not used to romance outside of her parents as well. I think up mm-hmm. until that point, love to her in any way was friends and that was pretty much all she experienced i don't think she's ever considered romance for herself or anyone being interested in her romantically so it was it was a culture really she says it multiple times through the the first novel is that if she were to get married in the future or she would have grow old in district 12 everyone in the district expected her to or at least she thinks that the district expect her to marry Gail and have kids with Gail and it's not her feelings that she's talking about she's talking about others expectations of her and societal yeah. expectations and that a lot of that comes with the expectation of oh well if it's a girl and a guy and you're that close yes. it must be romantic there's just that like heterosexual heteronormativity yep. definitely societal pressure there she just doesn't even consider her own emotions in that moment when she's with Peter there's a push and pull between you know society expects me to be with Gail because you can't be friends with the opposite sex or and her feelings towards Peter that she wants to be friends with him have a close relationship and make sure he doesn't die during the games but she's confused with how she actually feels about him because this is the first time she's allowed herself to consider an actual romantic relationship rather than a relationship based off of pressures around her. I guess moving on from that, we could talk about romance for Katniss during the first games. And I think a big thing, this is jumping the gun a little bit, but the fact that she's so confused by the fact that Peter thought it was real. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what's really confusing for her. Not the situation, but his reaction to the situation. Yeah, and she doesn't think that, you know, to her it was obvious that it wasn't real because she felt yeah. so robotic with how she was acting it kind of just takes yeah. it on the surface like why wouldn't someone be into romance right and i think that she assumes that the way that he behaved must have felt just as robotic for him yeah especially because Hamid points out right from the get-go peter knows how to do it he knows how to act he knows how to how to win over the crowd you know when peter greets all those people he doesn't actually love them like he acts of course he doesn't he's from the districts mm. um but he's so smooth and natural with it yeah and i think katniss should assume this is another thing peter's being smooth and natural with he has emotions that katniss just doesn't have or doesn't allow herself to have it's Hamish hey, hey, knew mm. from the get-go like katniss does not she's not like everyone else in a lot of ways more than just yeah. her strength Mitch is a little, uh, little interlude, but Hamish is the smartest character in that entire. Oh yeah, he'd be significantly smarter if he wasn't always, if his brain wasn't so diluted by alcohol. Honestly, I don't even think it makes him less smart. I really don't. Um, I don't know. I think, I think it's always there. It's more how much he's applying it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see that. I just don't <laughs> because you know alcohol distorts your brain. I think if you're, if you're genius. And honestly, I would call Hamish a genius. Not in the same way, yeah. you know, be genius. But Hamish is a genius. Yeah. Um, and I think that, I mean, okay, I guess maybe he could be smarter, but he's still pretty smart even when he's completely wasted. Yeah. Because when you're that smart, nothing can take it away unless you're completely passed out. Yeah, on that point, I would say, yeah, that Hamish, I, 
just because like alcohol dilutes your brain, I consider him like to have been really smart, and it's just you know his alcohol abuse yeah. takes it down a peg. But now he yeah. he's still very smart on alcohol. He's very smart, and it's interesting yeah. too because sometimes people that are that smart are more likely to turn to substance abuse. No, I think yes, yeah. yeah. The brain works too fast; they need to slow it down. Yeah, definitely, and he's 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 just such a smart character. <laughs> He, he Such a smart that. character. Yeah. This is why I loved Haymitch from day one. He's fantastic. Yeah. He really is. I always say Haymitch is my favorite character in the book. Effie's my favorite character in the movies. Yeah. Because Effie has more of a role in the movies, definitely. Which... Yeah, and like Elizabeth Banks eats. I saw a comment that said Elizabeth Banks had tinsel eyelashes in a dream. <laughs> and I think about that comment all the time. <laughs> I'm going to think about it from now on. Yeah, she, she definitely tinsel did. Tinsel eyelashes in a dream. The first book is less about the romance and more about your survival yeah and she's using romance as survival you know, societal yeah, pressures that could really reflect that and also introducing the character of course even though a lot of it's for survival and catching fire um we already know the characters we can focus more on their relationship catching fire did we want to go into catching fire i mean it's still messy mm-hmm. it's PETA. they use the whole marriage thing as a power play going back to the earlier point of power that they have I would say it's trying to give them some more power against the capital mm-hmm. by getting married and by complying to this particular rule so they can be allowed to continue to survive as victims. It's really interesting how due to the way the events play out for her own survival Katniss's view on romance has to shift when yes. it comes to power. Because power, um, romance becomes her lifeline in terms oh, of yeah. power, in terms of having any power over her situation, any power yeah. over Snow. That's yeah. really all she has most of the time, especially okay. during Catching Fire. I feel like it's very reflective in uh, with real IRA's experiences is that when it comes to societal pressure, the only way to gain that power back, well, not the only way, especially now, that we feel like we have to comply with that sort of ex- expectation of us that we have to get married in order to be like, you know, we're, we're just like you, you know, we have those sort of relationships too. And when people say that like, oh, you, you don't have those kinds of feelings at all, a lot different from us. We are all in our way. There's a whole spectrum that we can mm-hmm. still be in relationships. We can still have sex, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It's, I feel like it's very reflective of Peter's and Katniss's. Yeah, 100%. And I say this all the time. We spend far, far too much time in the ASPEC community focusing on what we can feel and can do. Yeah. To kind of write off what we can't. I think can't is a very unfortunate way of putting it yeah um but because it's that makes it seem like it's the lack when really it, it's not i mean yeah. technical definition it's a lack of attraction but that's not shortcoming that's not a failure to do something yeah. susan Collins definitely didn't purposely make the the character or Tannis as demi just because the, at the time it would have would not have been very well known at least asexuality might have been known a little bit at that point, but it wasn't a big thing for people to come out as our ace back in 2008. Uh, aromanticism was not really known at that time either. No, like yeah. asexuality, maybe aromanticism, no. Yeah, I, I know that asexuality has been around longer. I think it was a word that was used since, I think, the 90s. A long time, yeah. yeah, and it really got bigger in the more modern terminology. It's 10, 2001. So since okay. 2001, it's kind of when it started to bud. So I'd say by the time we get to, what, 2008, asexuality would have been somewhat known, but definitely yeah. not aromanticism or any of the micro-labels. Sex isn't a big thing, I would say, a huge thing in Katniss's life specifically, which is, which is why it makes me think she's asexual somewhere there. The only thing that people like to point out, I believe, is when Katniss describes kissing Peter as like a hunger for that she never experiences that with Gail, but the difference is that, like, obviously, she's gonna yeah. choose Peter because she has this hunger every time she kisses him, and I think that's like yeah. the closest to that sort of attraction. 
I think we have to talk about the beach scene. Oh, I love the beach scene. Of course, let's talk about that. Go ahead and start then, because, um, yeah, you seem passionate about it. Go ahead and start it off. Oh, I love the beach scene. When it comes to Katniss finally realizing her feelings, I would say, is the beach scene. And I think she doesn't notice it at the time because she does have to have Finnick later on point it out to her, especially during the 75th Hunger Games. There are a bunch of times that we can see that Katniss is slowly feeling more comfortable with Peter, which is where I get the idea that she is demi-romantic because it's taken this long to get there, that it's taken, what, a year at this point for them to become that close or for her to be comfortable with Peter at that point. Yeah, I just, I love the beach scene. Just as someone who's uh, romance favorable, I love it. Yeah, it's lovely. And one thing I will say, I do think the movie does it justice in yeah. the sense of cinematography oh yeah i think a lot of what cannot be said because it's you know it's not dialogue a lot of the description the thing that sets the tone for that scene in the books is portrayed by the cinematography Hmm. in general i think a highlight of the hunger games movies is the cinematography but that scene especially Um, yeah they do a really great job yeah it leaves a lot of area open for like coding like clear coding specifically Mm -hmm. and a lot of in fine is Katniss finally realizing her feelings and is Peter it's a, it's a question that I've always wondered because we don't have Peter's perspective uh, that no. much that did Peter finally realize then before he was hijacked that Katniss actually had real feelings for him in that moment right we really don't know anything about that yeah I choose to believe he did because just it's just for my own sanity but I he, also think he can tell I mean she was so robotic even just in like the kiss you've got to tell the difference right oh yeah definitely I mean at least I hope so I, he's so yeah. observant and emotionally in tune if he was somebody else I'd say maybe not honestly Gail Gail probably wouldn't be able to tell much of a difference no. in a lot of aspects but Peter's different you know mm-hmm. what What do you think of the, the beach scene I think it's lovely I think it's done really, really well, and we get to we get we get a really, really good balance mm. of I don't know how to explain this. We get a good balance of Katniss and Peter because these yeah. books are written in first person. So many times, um, I feel like we don't get to see as much of the other person because Katniss's internal voice dominates mm. the conversation, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But I think for a scene like that we need to focus a little bit more on the situation at hand and pull back okay. all of her, you know, all of her slightly off-topic thoughts mm. um, or elaborations that we don't need at that moment. We really have to focus on that. And I think it does yeah. a great job with that. Yeah, it definitely comes back with the cinematography there is that mm. they really close in on Peter as he is hearing Katniss say, I need you. That's why I choose to believe that he realized that she did have real feelings for uh, him. And yeah, mm. I, it's very reflective of the journey of someone who's demi-romantic or someone who's demi-romantic herself. I definitely see some you know, ideas of what, how I, I experience the world. It takes a while. Mm to have romantic feelings for someone and sometimes you just don't even realize it because you're not used to having those kinds of feelings it gets a little bit trickier in mocking day because oh, the yeah. focus is the war it's it's an important focus we also are missing Peta for half the book mm. <laughs> but of course we're worried about him though there's there's a lot going on her thoughts about him i mean it's also interesting how selfless she is because I feel like in the beginning, yeah. right, even though she liked PETA, it was always her survival first. If PETA had to die, he had to die. Whereas yeah. once we get to that point, she would sacrifice herself for him. Yeah. He wanted to live. And I think that shows how much it's changed as well. I think Mockingjay is very like, up, up and down with Katniss's feelings and being the face of the rebellion and Gail coming at her and being like, you love me, sort of. 
being no subject to go away. The fact that there was yeah. even the debate between Team Gale and Team Peta is insane to me. But Get it? He's a he's worth. I don't care. Gale's being a pick yeah. me during the movie. Oh, I swear, he's like, do you love me, sir? She almost just died twice. In fact, several times. Twice. Actually. Yeah. Calm down. Yeah, and it's not until Finnick actually, and this is before Peter comes back hijacked to District 13, Finnick points out to Katniss that she might have feelings for Peter, and she hadn't even really expressed it to herself at that point. She suffocated those feelings. Yeah. yeah. There's so much about Mockingjay that mm. I think is a little bit of untapped territory. There's so much that happens with Peter, and that's at the point of their relationship. Anything happening with Peter is what's emotionally happening to Katniss. Oh, yeah. And so you have him being missing. She sees how bad he looks in the videos and, and all mm-hmm. that stuff. And then he's back, but then he's to kill her. And it's just, it's a lot. And then you have that slow recovery. And a lot of it's about trust. Um, And that's the, that's the hard thing is you kind of have to have the balance of how much is it, is it her being ace back and how much is it her having trust issues and yeah. backgrounds and all of those things. There, there's definitely a really fine line between all of that. Candace just did not have enough time to process her feelings. I feel like no, until yeah. the very end. And that's why it's crazy yeah. it's marketed as a love story, like you said, because that's not what that is about. No, it's, it's not. It's just, it's crazy that to think that if it was made in a different time period, it would have been marketed very different. It would have been romantic aspects, but it would have been a different story. What, what, what do you think of the ending? I mean, she ended up having the life that she never thought she could have. Mm. Not just the life she didn't want initially, which I think is also true, but the life she did not think she could ever have. And access to time to process her feelings as well. And at the ending, before the epilogue, she states that her and Peter eventually grow back together because she needed to learn who he was after the hijacking as well. She didn't really take time during the war to do that because there was too much going on. Couldn't. Yeah. I mean, she couldn't. Definitely. There, there was just no time, no emotional processing space, and she was trying to protect Prim and an entire nation mm-hmm. of Panam. I think there's also something about how they got to grow together. I think yeah. Before she felt inferior to Peta in that way. Then after the hijacking, yeah. they got to help each other. Yes. Um, you know, he was still helping her grow more comfortable, but then she was helping him too. It felt more like a mutual, cool relationship. Yeah, instead of the power plays, once again, like there's so much to do with power plays in this novel series or franchise as a whole. And finally, Peter and Katniss don't have that power at play. There's no putting Peter on a pedestal and there's no putting Katniss on a pedestal. That They're just on an equal playing field now at the end. I know that you said to me before we recorded um, to do it how queer coded capital fashion and Sinner and Effie are as well. I know yes. we talked about it a little bit, but I think you had other points as well. Yeah, I mean, so much about Capital is eccentric, out of the box. And I think with the way we know queerness, that's, yeah. that's kind of inherently connected. I just think they're they're more of an anything goes society. You know, if you're yeah. buying your skin pink and things like that, I just I don't think they care as much. Just like we were talking about ancient Rome it's just do whatever you want um yeah. and i think a lot of that i also think other things like i think pink is probably more accepted than the capital that's the big yeah. thing i was thinking of i think the people of the capital are very very kinky and they're open about that yeah um i just think the people of the capital as a whole are experimentalist yeah definitely because they have the money to do so it's always the money yeah yeah when you have the money honestly people get bored yeah, and definitely. people of the capital are that eccentric because they're bored, and yeah. I think that plays into sexuality. I really do. Yeah, they have the time and the space to be able to experiment with that, and you know, in Hollywood, a lot, you know, with the Met Gala as well. Uh, and the Met Gala is just on my mind at the yeah. moment because of everything oh, going on. Yeah, not everything. <laughs> yeah, and I just the fashion there in the Met Gala is especially this year, is so similar to capital fashion. And yeah. you see a lot of just, like you said earlier, about like 
a lot of underground queerness in the early 20th century, they, you know, it, it happens still in Hollywood all the time. And I wouldn't be surprised yes. if that's very reflective of what happens in the capital as well. When you have that much money, you can buy whatever you want, quite literally. Buy. Can buy queerness. They can buy section. They, mm. I mean, even with the we saw Snow sold them. Mm. You can't convince me that Finnick wasn't being sold to a bunch of old rich men. Yeah, um, as unfortunate well, as it is. What's happening? I mean, I'm sure w- women too, probably mm. both, but still, you cannot convince me that all of his clientele were women because they were not. No, I was highly doubt it. Yeah. He was fortunate. He was being sold to 60 year old men. With the whole prostitution thing with Snow, it probably happened to multiple victims and there was 100%. Very, there was very likely so much going on in the capital. Because once again, they were, they were rich. They were wealthy and had a lot of free time, the space to do so. I truly think that if it were not for the force field and, you know, Hamish being made an example of, if he would have won in a normal way and Snow would have been cool with him, mm. uh, he would have had a very similar situation as Finnick. Oh, yeah. Because he was... Because he was, he was like the rugged, handsome... At 100%, if he would have not been a rebel... He would have been, I think, very, very similar to Finnick. Oh yeah, definitely. He was probably pre Finnick, and Finnick because he's so much younger than yeah. Hamish. They likely were careful with how they treated Finnick because of it. I wouldn't be surprised mm-hmm. if they treated Finnick carefully in the arena, knowing that he'd like to win, and that's probably why he got that weapon so early on, the most expensive mm-hmm. gift ever gifted in the games, and he. Snow probably was quite careful with like watch out for him. Um, we'll deal with him in such and such way yeah. with the pay match. Mm-hmm. And that is an unfortunate thing that is cut out of the movies is people don't realize how much Hamish influenced the games and influenced yeah. the culture. Yeah, Hamish changed everything. Yeah, just his cat has changed everything. It, without Hamish, not just in the events of the books. Although that is also true, but just in the events of the games in general, without Hamish, we would have never gotten to the rebellion. Oh, and no. like I said, not just not just because of everything he does to the rebellion in the books and in the modern time, although of course he does a ton, but because of his games. I wouldn't be surprised if the underground work again for the rebellion that happened in the original trilogy, it would have yeah. started with Hamish. Hundred percent. I really believe, even though you know. Katniss was the face of the revolution. I think Hamish was the revolution. And I will oh. always stand by that. And, and they're so similar in that way. It's they're shadows of each other. We don't have a lot of Arrows representation in the media, and it's just that it's a product of its time. The Hunger Games. I always, always, always want Hello Arrow representation. I talk about this a lot on my account. Mm-hmm. About how arrow arrows are so overlooked, um, yeah, very specifically demonized. It's just we need representation for that. And honestly, Definitely. I mean, the Hunger Games are kind of a. I feel like, like I said, there's so many avenues. Yeah, a series like the Hunger Games is a series that's very well suited to do something like that. It's it allows for so many queer codes with you know we discuss the fashion and experimentation. And if there was another book, you could very easily just slip a little bit of information in there about like an hour, hour character. You know, they might not be in a romantic relationship. Maybe they're in a queer platonic relationship. And mm-hmm. that's how you do that kind of representation. I think queer yeah. platonic could be quite good as well for representation. I think that's probably the easiest to put in there if there's another book. It is easy and it's very capitalist. It's modern. Yes. It's fresh. It's exciting experimental in a way not to say you know it's all a big experiment that's not what i'm saying yeah. but it's that newer those newer ideas the capital seems yeah. to have what was your perfect representation in the hunger games and media in general like the hunger games be? i don't think i'd want a whole elaboration on one character i would want it to be more the culture you know even yeah. if it's just in little bypassing conversations between people of the capital i think mm. you can say a lot um with just just subtle things you know i think yeah. that 
in something like the Hunger Games, you don't have time to dwell on a whole character's sexuality. That's not the point of it. You can you can show, you can use context clues. Yeah. And I think that a place like the Capitol has a lot of potential to show queerness, including ace spec identities. With me saying the culture, it, it's like world building. Suzanne Collins is so good with world building. It'd be yeah. great to see her add to that with the queer code she's already set herself up with and I think mm-hmm. I think it was accidental just because of the time period was written in. But I, I think she did perfectly set herself up there and writing another book with an extension of the culture, it it would be so interesting to read and it'd be an amazing representation. And all it takes is some, you know, dialogue and observation of people. Yeah. Really, you know, you don't have to say this is this person's label. And I think that's where people get caught up of saying, Well, if you add queer representation you're gonna be focusing too much on it and things yeah. like that. You don't have to at all. It's, you know, people can, there's a difference between coded and not really saying anything and then flat out saying it. There's something in yeah. between there that's nuanced. That's reading between the lines, but to the point where it's very clearly intentional. You know what I always use as an example, truly really a fantastic queer representation that never uses a single label is Steven Universe. Um, yeah. I adore Steven Universe as a show. Um, Steven Universe is an incredibly queer show. Um, most of the characters, I'd say the vast majority of the characters are openly queer. Like, you cannot tell me that, like, Pearl is canonically a lesbian, and yet they never call her a lesbian. They never use a single label. Yeah. So nothing's being, you know, nothing's awkward or being force-fed or taken away from plot, because yeah. they don't talk like that. It's just a natural part of the world, yeah. but everybody knows what's going on. And yeah. I think uh, something like the Capitol has a lot of potential to do something like that. With when it comes to labels, it they're like a helping hand essentially. Well, you don't need a label. People don't have to be labeled specifically either. Like I label myself as a sexual false femi romantic asexual specifically because it's easy for me to set boundaries when I have those labels, and mm-hmm. I don't think everyone needs a label. In order to do that, you just need to be like, this person isn't like everyone else, you know, they act like this and they have relationships like this because, you know, that's just who they are, that's who they are as a character. And it, it just to do natural diversity in shows, yeah. you don't need labels anyway, because the label means something different to everyone anyway. It's more about the experiences. Oh, like, yeah. Type of, that type of life, you know, type of lifestyle. Um, how it fits in with the culture. Thank you so much for being on my channel again and recording. Thank you so today. much for inviting me. Definitely cool. appreciate it. I've had a great time talking about this. Yeah, well, you have had some amazing points for this video. Thank you. That hopefully the comments, then, yeah, right? the comments. Yes, can... and you've gotten to watch my room grow dark. Yeah, <laughs> great. I didn't think to turn the light on before I started this. That's all good. We can see your face. Hopefully, well. I know it'll be it'll be great. A fun little you, people can help use it as a timestamp. Yeah. Oh, where did I leave exactly. off? This was the lighting in the room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and like, they'll just put it down. Thank you for having me. Absolutely lovely. Yeah, and hopefully it starts a bit of a conversation in the comments, and I will be there. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I'll be lurking I'll be in the comments. Too. Yeah. <laughs> great. I love a good lurk. Yeah. Alright guys, that is it for today's video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Once again, all of Rachel's details are in the description down below. Uh, please comment uh, what you guys thought of today's video. Any queer codes that you thought were accurate? You think, hey, maybe this character is also queer coded that we didn't mention. I would love to hear your thoughts. So comment down below, like and subscribe, and go and follow Rachel on all her platforms. Once again, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, but I've been CJ. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.